Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to today's episode right here on the School of Radiance podcast, the place to be to look and feel our best, as well as learn about different strategies for slowing aging in a more sophisticated way, especially in today's episode, because we're going to be getting into the genetics and what's involved in actually really looking and feeling our best and also where some of these things are kind of not necessarily moving in the way that we want to, where we see this type of space going, especially with genetic testing. So we're going to be talking about that. We're going to talk a little bit about biohacking in today's episode as well. And I'll give an introduction of today's guest. We have Dr. Sam Shea. He solves health puzzles for busy, health-conscious moms and mompreneurs to optimize their wellness, longevity, and skin health throughout through unique genetic testing. Known as the friendly lab nerd, Dr. Shea genetics analysis and functional testing for data-driven results. Dr. Shea is also a stand-up comic using clean observational comedy to educate and entertain. And you can learn more about today's guest in the show notes of this episode. And of course, also at Dr. Sam Shea, S-H-A-Y, Dot com. Welcome, 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 Dr. Sam Shea. It's great to have you here. And the tradition is I ask everyone who joins us on the show, what is radiance to you? Let's kick things off with the unlimited dollar question. Sure. So I, when you ask me that question, I, I just reflect on people in my life that, that I experienced as radiant. And the very first person that comes to mind was my nanny. Uh, named Bridie. And in fact, I, you mentioned, you know, the, my bio says I'm a stand up comic. I'm actually releasing my first uh, or performing my first hour special in a week and a half here in Denver called Neuro Spicy Love, Life, and Comedy on the, spe- on the Spectrum. So, because I have Asperger's. And um, that, that, I mean, that's what the topic's about. And I, I talk about my experience of Bridie who was the one who really showed care in the family and she just radiated care and she had no agenda for me. She was just kind and present and she, she just filled the room with this radiance. Now she was not a physically healthy person. She was not, there was something different. There's something else that was radiating. I know, I know people who are physically radiant, just, just glowing. And then there was a different, there was a different type of radiance. I'm not taking away from that other radiance, but this one was a very distinct quality. How she cultivated it, I think one, she knew that her time was limited because she was slowly dying from a particular disease process. Uh, Two, she was deeply, deeply religious. And she, I know plenty of religious people that don't glow. Uh, And so why did she, and I can only speculate that her expression of her faith was internal, internal, in, internal embodiment of the message, not external talking. That she she became embodied with her understanding of her religion to the point where she just glowed with that message of kindness and compassion, and. Uh, that's, that was my very first imprint of someone who was radiant and, and Bridie, Bridie has always, the memory of Bridie has always been my North star, you know, to remind me when things have not gone well, or I've met people that were less than radiant. Bridie, I've always held as my North star to know that that level of spiritual radiance is absolutely possible, even if in a body that is failing. Now, thank you for mentioning that, that this individual who is your nanny, correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, that she had this type of impact on you. So for those of you tuning in and you're learning how to care for yourself, you're le- learning how to show up as your brightest version and look fantastic in the process, get your health optimized and on point and all of that. We don't always recognize that when we take the time to do this kind of work and better ourselves, it has this beautiful downstream effect on others, which is great. And thank you so much for mentioning that she also had a faith. I've also observed this 
and mm -hmm. very radiant individuals that just are different. I feel more relaxed around them. I feel happier. I feel like I be myself, right? This is all part of etiquette is helping others feel comfortable around you. So I'm curious if we were to go a little bit deeper on how someone in your life led by example as being a radiant human, how did that make you feel? Uh, one, I had, well, around Bridie, she, uh, I, I had a bit of a turbulent childhood. Um, and Bridie was the, Bridie was the protective bubble. And I could just, I could just go see her and know that I was just accepted and cared for just by my mere existence, not having to prove anything or I was, didn't live up to some unreachable standard or, or whatever, whatever was expected of me by my parents or, or the, the community around me. And the, 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 when I tap into it, what I, what I emotionally remember with Bridie was just feeling relief, not, not having to perform, not having to do anything except just, just be present and everything is okay. And I don't need to prove anything. And that's, yeah, she provided a, a, a true safe space in an actual sense of the word. Beautiful. So it sounds like she did a couple of things. She soothed your nervous system as well and really helps with that. You know, we tend to forget how our childhoods affect us and helping us develop our attachment styles and things like that. So what a beautiful impact that that woman made on your life and the legacy that you're sharing today in the work that you do. So thank you so much for answering that question. Now I, I will say one other thing. I, I want to add one other thing. So I, I've also experienced that you know, in the, there, there's, when we talk, you mentioned about faith. So I just want to offer, there's a couple of the people I've met in my life who were distinctly um, Buddhist and not having any faith per se, but they glowed also. And they had a very similar compassion and just presence. And I think I think what's common between someone of faith and someone who's Buddhist, who literally has nothing to believe in, like there's no thing there. Um, what, what is common, I see them is a, uh, a knowingness of the permanency slash impermanency through their entire body. Like in one hand, it could be permanency in the other hand, it's impermanency, but actually ironically leads to the same, same state. And um, so my, my, ex my experience is that, there is that people can have if they believe fully in one or the other they end up in the same spot which is this interesting kind of yin yang polarity around uh around radiance i'm so glad that you mentioned the yin and the yang because the definition that i found for radiance actually comes from ayurveda it's the electromagnetic projection of our body, mind, spirit, energy bodies and other bodies. The radiant body is the 10th body, but then it's also balance. So I love the TCM aspect of balancing the yin and the yang as well. So thank you so much for mentioning that. When I hear you say that, it kind of like validates what my observation of radiance has been too. So looking at how you support people, you're an expert in genetic testing and helping people really look at ways that they can support themselves. Now in the world of so many different tests available and different things that we can do, and also we're going to get into the future of where things are going and how we can navigate that. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you know which type of genetic testing is the best for aging well, health optimization and skin health? I'd love to hear your perspective on which type sure. of test kits are the best. So when you're looking, if the goal, is, there's multiple different goals in the genetics universe. And so the, the most important thing about genetics is knowing what, what's your goal, what's your destination. Some people's goal is just to find out ancestry, like what percentage Irish they are. Other people's goal is to figure out paternity. Other people's goal is to figure out, do I have this very specific niche gene around a specific, like Huntington's disease or something like some, I call it medical genetics, where they're looking for the one, it's like germ theory. There's one gene causes one disease, like one germ causes one disease. 
so that that's kind of medical genetics. And then if we're looking at long-term health, well-being, longevity, outside any overt, hardwired, gonna get it genetic, like which are very, very rare, but they do exist. Like these these hard-coded singular genes to disease things that they're, they're rare, but they do exist. The other set of genetics to look at is looking at not at the diseases, but the drivers. And there are seven major drivers for all diseases. And then you can look at the same drivers as what, how do you, how do you dance with them in a way that you have the most long-term health, well-being, longevity, radiance, uh, as long as in fulfilling life as possible. So the seven drivers, they're not the disease genes themselves. I'm not looking for the cancer gene, the heart disease gene, the diabetes gene, the neurodegeneration gene, the stroke gene. I'm not looking for that. I'm looking at the genes for inf to that, that manage inflammation, that manage free radical damage scavenging in the mitochondria specifically. So things like MNSOD, the manganese uh, superoxide dismutase, not the other SOD genes that are operate outside the mitochondria. I'm looking at liver detox genes on phase one and phase two, the, the upstream ones. I'm looking at vitamin D receptors, not necessarily vitamin D synthesis, but the pathway to get vitamin D from the blood into the cell, not the pathway from sunlight into the blood. And then I'm looking at methylation genes of which there's many more than just MTHFR. Uh, I'm looking at cardiovascular circulation genes and then looking at fat energy metabolism genes. And so those are the seven drivers. And if those are the ones that control all the things underneath it. And then, so that's layer one is, am I looking at the seven drivers? Layer two is, am I looking at the upstream genes of those seven drivers? Because there's hundreds of genes that directly or indirectly influence inflammation. I want to look at the top 15 that control the hundreds underneath. Same thing with liver detox, same thing with the, all, all these other ones. I want to look at the, the, the most important ones. I then want to look, the third layers, I want to find the genes of the, what's remaining which have at least 10% variation in the population. So I'm actually testing for genes that are likely to show up. The people who have that 0.001% variation, that really matters to them. And that's where you need a PhD specialist in that area. That's more like the medical genetics. There's an absolute place for that. That's not what I'm talking about. People may need both to have, but people absolutely would need the big picture stuff first. So the third criteria is there's at least 10% variation in the population. And then the fourth criteria is do the genes have peer reviewed research done in great journals done on humans, not wombats or nematodes or mice that through lifestyle and diet nutrition alone will shift the epigenetic expression of the gene in a direction we want, not, not pharmaceuticals, uh, not, not any like super out there treatments, it's lifestyle, diet, nutrition. So those are the four criteria, seven drivers upstream, at least 10% variation. Is there legit research on humans that lifestyle, diet, nutrition will shift the epigenetic expression in the direction we want. That's how, you know, you're looking at a really, really good genetics test. And there's only about 150, 100 to 150 of those genes. It's not that many out of the 25 to 30,000 genes. It's about 150. It's not that much, which is good news and bad news. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic framework. And I love that you're, so you, for those of you tuning in, you've heard me mention the word epigenetics. We have our DNA. That's the way it expresses itself. But in our environment, so oxidative stressors, toxins, and air, water, lighting, electromagnetics, the foods you eat, and different pathogens, these can really all impact the way that your DNA expresses itself which is the study of epigenetics just to, just to sort of clarify that. So if we want great looking skin, we want to look at the epigenetics of our skin cells and all of the other systems, not just the skin as one organ, but how it's operating with as a symphony and an orchestra with all of these other beautiful organs within our body as well. So I love that you're, you know, taking the hard data of the genetic testing and then, Hey, what are the lifestyle modifications we can do? Now, what's interesting with this, and we were chatting before we started recording, is mm -hmm. that, you know, it's well known that some companies, they, it's, you know, a big data mine to 
get you to pay for a test and then they take all your data and then it gets sold to like insurance companies and who knows what used for other things. So it is important to know who are the people behind the genetic tests that you are looking at. What are they doing with your data to make sure it's as secure as possible. But what are your thoughts on these companies that are using algorithms to then create this template of what the lifestyle, diet, and nutrition shifts would be? What do you think a computer would be really good at, like AI algorithm? And then where does the human and the practitioner come into this? Sure. So the algorithm is great at finding the research, assuming that it's not hallucinating the research papers, like we've seen recently in the legal case. I don't know if you saw this, but a lawyer had AI put together legal defense and chat GPT literally just hallucinated case law like that did not exist. And this guy lost his license and it's all, and, and it's, it's, it's a legal presence, but set by this lawyer who just didn't want to bother to research it you know, himself. So you're on, on many, many assumptions that that the AI will actually correctly scavenge all the research and find the relevant papers that are actually relevant and knows how to summarize and can spot a good study and so on, so on, so on. There's a lot, that's a lot of speculation right there. A, a lot of variables to jump through. What it can do is quickly collate what is the latest research paper? What has it been as kind of, do a retrospective correlation back to earlier papers. Are there new, are there new unfound um, n- nutrition, lifestyle, diet interventions that uh, actually help other genes that weren't didn't know you previously could? Like so, for example, vitamin D receptors. There's very very few things that upregulate vitamin D receptors, and it would be great to have like five more. Um, so that's that's where these AI things would be fantastic if we can find some other ways to upregulate VDR receptors. Um, the, the problem is that when, when the rubber meets the road and you're get, the, the problem that I've had with all these other genet, all the other genetics companies is that you send in your swab and whether you punch it through an app or, or some other variable or whatever, you're sent this generic list of like 300 health tips and nothing is prioritized or organized and they don't tell you how they've organized it. It's just like each gene seems equally alarming. And people end up in this overwhelm, confusion, uh, and intimidation, and they can then careen backwards into nihilistic fatalism. It's like, well, I got these bad genes. Oh, well, I don't know where to start and what to do. And what an individual can do is help guide what is the actual priority, and then, but, but fit it in with the person's reality. So like there's, there's the ideal, and then there's the person's ordeal. And a real clinician is not a perfectionist, they're a pragmatist. We have to know the perf- what we have to know what's ideal, but as a pragmatist, we have to work within a client's ordeal. And that's where that that's where the, the human element really does come in. And my uh, I mean, so for example, like when uh, when I work with people with genetics, I have an option for office hours where because how do you how do you get access to the principal person in a way that's scalable and if people you know at, at a budget that works i figured out it's office hours so one of the things that, that there can be a hybrid model where like people have access to all this back end uh video library of going through all the genes and what it means and, and the reports and how to do that but then there's there is a human element that's available at, uh, in, in a scalable way. So that, that's one method to do it. Then people have one-to-one client, you know, practitioner relationships. Um, but, but ultimately the, the benefit of genetics testing is that it's, you're in it for the long term because your results are permanent and your, what, what people can do to optimize their genetics. Once you know what to do, that doesn't change. So, uh, people can, that's kind of where the limit of the AI stuff and ends. It's like, here's the, here's the information. Great. And now we're done with the, with the AI bots. Now it's implementation. And that's where uh, support from the human element or a group scenario uh, comes in. 
I completely agree with you. I love that you mentioned the ideal versus ordeal. And I see this all the time when, you know, someone's looking at a skincare routine, they'll do a skin quiz from a skincare company. And, you know, they'll answer this question, this question, then boom, here's the products for you. But it doesn't take into account, you know, your budget, your lifestyle, what ingredients you might want to be avoiding. What are your specific goals? What have you had in the past that worked or didn't pass? And then the other thing is the, the ordeal, you know, not to put a negative spin on it at all, mm -hmm. but it's the implementation part of it, the family unit. Say, for example, like myself, when I started doing what I do, you know, my loved ones didn't get what I was doing. They didn't see the importance of it. It was an important value to me to look and feel my best, but it wasn't a value to them. And I had to put boundaries up to make sure that, you know, my air purifiers were staying plugged in and, you know, I wasn't eating foods with canola oil cooked in a Teflon pan if I had family dinners. And so that's one of the components of the ordeal side of things, which is where we actually have to learn the skills to actually communicate these values and boundaries effectively so that we can stay on our track. And AI isn't going to know that. They're not going to know about what the family dynamics are, your budget, your lifestyle, all these things, all these nuances. So I totally agree with you that the what a practitioner can do instead of an AI person is that mentorship, that emotional, the emotional shifts that happen, especially if someone starts to detox, right? And they clear parasites from their central nervous system and their brain starts to work better. They reduce that inflammation. There's going to be shifts with them too. And then how do they start to engage with the world and loved ones now that they're actually very different in the way that they're operating because they're healthier and their brain can work better. So that was just, I love the way that you explain things, Dr. Sam Shea, in such a beautiful, concise, eloquent way. Thank you. Now, when it comes to this concept of gene clusters, I'd love for you to share what that is and what are some of the key gene clusters that we can look at? Sure. So when, when I talk about the genes of, say, inflammation, which, which clearly has a really big impact on skin health, as does the genes for free radical damage, scavenging in the mitochondria, liver detox, vitamin D receptors, and so on. The, the clusters are those, as, as, as I'll name, some, I'll give some examples, but the, the clusters are, are the genes that fit within those four criteria. Seven drivers, most important ones in them, at least 10% have variation in the population. There's peer reviewed research behind them. So you can actually do something, you can be practical about it. So for example, when we look at inflammation, there's, there's 15 major genes that control inflammation and they're broken down into three segments inflammation initiation, inflammation propagation, and inflammation extinguishing. So how easily do you spark into inflammation? Does the spark just rage once it starts? Does it just rage into a, an inferno? And then do you have squirt guns or fire hoses to put them out? So that those are three different ways. So for example, the interleukin ones are and TNF alpha and interleukin six are classically part of the initiation, interleukin-6 and TNF-alpha kind of, kind of cross over into propagation as well. They're, they're kind of a center point for the inflammatory process. Then you've got the CRP genes, uh, the, the COX-2 genes, um, interleukin-8, interleukin-18, as I would put in the propagation side of inflammation. And then you have the interleukin-10s that are for extinguishing. I would put the interleukin-10s as the most important of those 15 followed by TNF-alpha and interleukin-6. The reason why is that no matter how small a fire you've got, if you can't put it out, it's, it's going to cause problems. So the ability to extinguish inflammation, that, those, those are the, of, those are, of the 15, those are the top three, and then followed by interleukin-6 and TNF-alpha because they're such keystones in, in the bridge between initiation and propagation. Then there's clustering even within that. So the three CRP genes in the propagation, CRP, is, CRP genes uh, code for the acute phase protein of, of inflammation in the liver. And I've seen uh, people have some real struggles with uh, detoxing hormones when they have all three 
uh, of those CRP genes have variations, not because they are involved directly with the detox process, but because when someone gets inflamed, either from like over exercise, uh, toxins, molds, uh, incompatible foods, environmental pollution, high stress, sleep deprivation, you know, all the, all the, all the different reasons we have, the liver will have an overreactive inflammatory response. So if the liver's job is to detox and to deal with inflammation, uh, it's going to prioritize the inflammation over detox. And the best analogy I could think of is if you walk into a kitchen and you have to take out the garbage, but there's a, the, but the stove is on fire, what's the priority? It's putting out the fire. It's not the garbage. And the liver is the same way. We're going to prioritize the inflammation over detox. So what happens is that people who have this, these three liver genes as variations, when they get inflamed, they can't detox because the liver is busy trying to put out the fire. And so for women, this shows up as their cycle gets gets thrown off. And for men, it can look like gynecomastia or man boobs because they can't detox estrogen properly. And it just estrogen builds up and builds up and redeposits fat in different areas of the body, most notably the chest. And I, what, what I'm describing to you, I've actually presented at genetics conferences on the subject is exercise induced obesity because the, the case studies I had two, two men and one woman, they had this particular pattern. Uh, there was some more details to it, some other particular genes that fed into it, but they over-exercised, which gave them excess and in, became excess inflammatory state. And then their liver got clogged up by the inflammation. And they all, then they developed uh, hormonal issues for the men. It was man boobs. And for the female, their cycle just stopped. And for them, their, the, the lifestyle diet, nutrition recommendations was not exercise more and eat less as they were getting putting on more and more weight. It was putting them on an anti inflammatory liver supporting ex stop the xenoestrogen exposure diet with only at most two, two safe high intensity interval training sessions a week. The in between days were walking or movement, and lots of sleep, clean water, etc. It was not cut calories and exercise more It was actually do less intense exercise with more movement and then deflame, detox, de-estrogen, and, and support, calm the inflammatory system down. And that's what helped um, one gentleman lose 40 pounds in a month, another gentleman lose two pounds a week for, it was either 11 or 13 weeks, I can't remember, some prime number above 10. Uh, and she, her muscle tone returned and her cycles came back. So this is, this is where knowing and understanding clusters of genes really help. Uh, including like looking at the liver detox genes, there's certain clusters of those liver detox genes that focus around estrogen, like the GSTP1 gene, the CYP182, uh, uh, I believe, uh, and a couple others that are involved with estrogen metabolism. So people have clusters. It's, it's like if someone has one gene that's a variant, meaning it's not working the best, that's that's an issue. But if they have two or three that also have variants, it's not one plus one plus one equals three. It's one plus one plus one equals nine. Like when, when you when you hit when you hit a gene, multiple gene variants in a row in the same process, that's when thing that's when the cluster really becomes significant. When all three of those CRP genes have variants, that's when a lot of inflammation happens. Not like one, it's when all three happen that there's this exponential effect. So it's, it's the clusters I'm really looking for, not hunting for a one specific gene. I'm so happy to hear you say the reduction of inflammation first is the priority before detoxing. And, you know, that's why you've all heard me say this on the show, reduce your exposure to toxins in your air, water, lighting, electromagnetics, eat the right foods for your epigenetics by testing for it, reduce things like pathogens, like yeast, fungi, heavy metals, mold, and mm -hmm. parasites. Do that first before doing a detox. Mm -hmm. Because really. if you try and detox, you very well could experience something called a Herxheimer's reaction. And I personally have experienced this. I took a couple days off of the typical antioxidants that I do take to reduce that inflammation. And that response is not fun. You know, I was flat out in bed for a couple of days. So 
when people think about, oh, I'm going to do a detox, I'm going to do a liver detox, I'm going to do a please, parasite please don't, detox. Don't. I know, don't exactly. <laughs> yeah. And they, they haven't done any of this work ahead of time. It's like you're kind of like you just said, the, uh, the stove's on fire, but you want to take the garbage out. You got to mm -hmm. deal with the, the other things first. So I completely agree with you. And I'd love to segue into some of the mistakes that I see a lot of people making, and I, I'm, I think you probably are going to agree with me on this, that when people think biohacking, they think all these fancy gadgets. And one of the barriers uh -huh. that I hear about people talking about biohacking is, oh, it's so expensive. It's only for the yeah. elite. And in fact, you might agree with me on this, that you really want to just utilize tech to help purify your environment first before thinking even about a red light therapy. What, what, are, your, what are your thoughts on that? Because um, last year I wrote a paper on reducing oxidative stress to promote better skin aging. And it was kind of like this framework of how to reduce oxidative stress and then consider different pieces of technology and detoxing. Because I feel like people are really lost. And I know you're, you're an OG you're an original gangster in this space, and and you actually have published some materials as some frameworks to really help people out. Mm -hmm. Because I don't, it's not never my intention for people to feel lost or scrambled. Because when we're overwhelmed, we're likely not going to make great decisions or stay on track. When you try and piecemeal things together, you got to have a plan, and for that plan to be customized to what your body specifically needs, I feel like that's the best plan. So share with me some of your comments and insights and resources that you have to help each other out. So many comments. Okay. So my, I have, I'm an explicit critic of the biohacker movement. Um, not that I don't love the toys. Here's, here's my criticism biohacking has all the toys, but no map. There's no map there. There's that's how do you know you need red light therapy versus like super special coconut oil and coffee versus, you know, you have to do some specialized, um, brainwave, you know, trauma release in your brain versus having to get yak butter versus whatever, you know, whatever goji berry juice to, squirt up your nose. I don't know. There's, there's so many different supplements and toys and call it shiny object syndrome, or, or I call it magic bulletism, that people are chasing a magic bullet. And the problem is that I was very chronically ill growing up, very chronically ill. And that's part of why I got into functional medicine. And what I found when I was just chasing one person's, well, try this, it worked for me, try this, it worked for me, try this, it worked for me. And it never worked for me. It did work, for, you know, it worked for them if I was in their downline for whatever goji berry juice I happened to be taking, you know, it, it wasn't, it, it was, and the answer was, well, if it didn't work, you just need more of it. Or you're just stressed out because this clearly works because it worked for me and all my other people in my organization. So I got, you know, natural health gaslit and shamed because I wasn't, getting the miraculous results that would help their marketing and, and I wasn't failing as their downline or whatever. Uh, so what I realized is that when I got into clinical practice and I had a lot of empathy and compassion for people who were uh, kind of kicked to the side by both the medical and the natural health communities. So my first practice, uh, which I had for eight years, was working with chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, autoimmune, hormone imbalance, gut issues, all usually all in the same person. And what I found on detailed lifestyle analysis is that there were 10 pillars to health and that there were 10 separate categories. And what I found with people who were chronically unwell that were trying to biohack their way out of this is that at a minimum of seven pillars, seven pillars crumbling. So with the issue with biohacking, any product personality or protocol is usually really good at one to three pillars. But if you've got seven that are crumbling, you're going to get mixed or inconsistent or short term results. It, it's the, 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 the best analogy that I've heard is like you sit on seven tacks, you remove three of them. Technically, you're healthier, but you don't feel better and you're not going to get any. But it's it's you're, you still feel generally the same. So when the, the thing was, is that people had a different set of seven pillars. 
So th there was variation, but there was a pattern within the variation. And the, the, the 10 pillars in brief, I have a whole, if people want to know, I have a whole ebook called, literally called Biohack Your Biohacking, a common sense guide to functional medicine and uh, lifestyle change. I, or some, that's, I think that's the subtitle. It's been a while since I looked at the subtitle, but, but Biohack Your Biohacking, uh, it's just you know, drsamshay.com forward slash biohack. And when did you write that, Dr. Samshay? 2011 was when I mm -hmm. first drafted that. Um, and uh, my, yes, yeah, so my, my, criti my criticisms go pretty far back. But the thing is, is that once you know the pillars that need support, then you can go and get the right shiny objects and toys and things, whether they're low tech or high tech. So I could redeem the very bio. If someone had a goji berry juice shaped hole in their nutrition pillar, and all the other pillars were at 70, 80%, but their nutrition pillar was at 20%. And just all it was, was goji berry juice deficiency. They could take the goji berry juice and feel amazing and then go and build a business on that. Say everyone needs goji berry juice. So I could actually, the, the model, the template model explained their experience. So I, I could then now have a, a meta model that could explain both realities, the person that wasn't getting berry from this meta, this, you know, this theoretical goji berry juice and the people who did succeed with it. Now you can place obviously goji berry juice with insert shiny object, supplement, diet, visualization, whatever of choice. So, so the model, the, the, the model, I believe this 10 pillars is the model the biohacker community is looking for that they don't even realize necessarily. Now there's many other models out there. There's, you know, there's, there's the triangle of this. There's the, the five steps of that. There's the dodecahedron of this. There's the inverted rhomb rhombus of wellness, whatever you want to call it. I don't care. You know, er everyone's got their thing. I, I found 10 and great. Some people may, I met one guy with 37. I was like, dude, no one's going to learn 37. Forget it. Not going to happen. Your model is very complete, but it's, it's, it's impractical. So, uh, the, that's what I would encourage, whether you use my model of the 10 pillars of health or someone else's, just have a model. That's the key. If you want to biohack, have a map. Some maps are better than others. But if you at least have a map, you, you're going to you're going to waste way less time, way less money and way less frust ex ex energy on trying to figure out what to do next. I love that you use the word trying. I've been talking about this word on the show here for quite a while. And also the terms shiny object, magic bullet. So for those of you tuning in that have been following the show for a while, you know that I talk about these things. So when I get to interview someone like Dr. Sam Shea, who's like validating what I've been sensing, what I've been piecing together, like it's, it's a very validating for myself too. So thank you for, for sharing this perspective. You know, we have this shared perspective and see the value of no longer trying, but really testing instead of guessing what we're doing, I think mm -hmm. is the most straightforward, linear approach that's going to really push those shiny objects and gimmicks out of the way and the skin and rejuvenation world you know there's a new one coming out every day that's being preached from the mountaintops of kim k social media right and uh, uh, so we one, one clarification is that i think um i wouldn't necessarily push the shiny objects out of the way i think it'd be you learn to pick which ones will actually be the most likely to help yeah and, and and push the excess that either is useless in, no, in, in all situations or not useful for you in your current situation, those you can push away. I, I, think, I think then what happens is that we can then be very judicious about what we, what shiny object we actually let into our orbit. Oh, I love that clarification. I, I warmly received that. And mm. one of the great things of what you just pointed out is the fact that we are innovating all the time. There's always yeah. new information coming out. So sometimes, sometimes those shiny objects and new gadgets and gizmos and gimmicks may, might be that initially, but then they become a better received once we learn more about them, like a laser for skin and rejuvenation. But it takes a little bit of time for the energy and the recovery and all the different nuances with a piece of tech or a skincare ingredient to kind of be finessed to the point where mm -hmm. I think it's worth um, investing in. 
The other thing you mentioned is the bio-individuality component. This is so key that not everything is going to work for everyone. So when I hear people say terms like, you know, this is safe and effective for anyone and everybody, you, you can never actually ever, I think, accurately use that statement because it's actually too extreme. And we don't want to be moving within extremes. We want to be balanced in our approach. So this bio-individual approach, um, which is what you highlight with your work in genetics, is so key. So for people who are looking to move forward with looking at testing and things like that, how do you help people, Dr. Sam Shea? How do you help people and where can people find you? Sure. So what, what you're describing on biochemical individuality is it resonates with me deeply. I actually call, I, you know, you see these papers that come with, oh, everyone needs this nutrient or this thing or that thing. I call that bell curve biochemistry, where they just look at the bell curve and they find a thing that's in the middle and then they extrapolate to everyone. And that's, that's, that is both true and deeply untrue because people are not one bell curve. There are thousands of different bell curves and that people are in different parts of each bell curve. And so use, identifying people individually, what people's needs are biochemically and genetically is, is the foundation. If people resonate with the style of genetics analysis that I described, it's really straightforward to find me. It's just drsamshay.com, D-R-S-A-M-S-H-A-Y.com. And if you want, uh, there's there's a couple uh, free gifts that people can get started to learn more about my, my models. One is the drsamshay.com forward slash biohacker, which is the 10 pillars of health and going into much more detail of each pillar and the functional testing and the lifestyle questions they're in. The other is drsamshay.com forward slash genetics. And in there, there's a free ebook and a free genetics mini course to help lear people learn and take action on what to do about their genetics. And I do have a genetics program that's available. There's a DIY uh, where there, there's a full online support course. There's entire, I, I have the um, entire customized report I've been working on for years. And then I have an office hours model as well if people want uh, some, some more uh, connection into a group field and being able to have uh, questions answered in a more live format. So there, those would be the two easiest ways um, and to, to connect with me. And I, I think that genetics is the single most valuable test anyone could ever invest in without even a close second because your genetics results are for life and you don't have to retest them. I mean, unless you wanna investigate other genes that weren't in the original test, but that's not even a retest, that's a different test. But once you do your genes, you're done. And the value from that just extrapolates and, and amortizes over as many decades as you want to live with radiance. I love it. So everybody, learn more about Dr. Sam Shea at drsamshay, D-R-S-A-M-S-H-A-Y.com. His information are going to be in the show notes of this episode as well. And I, I, you know, I know we have to run here, but I do have one final question for you. Mm -hmm. What's, I have to ask this, what's the driver and your passion behind this? For me, it's to help save people time and money and stress and like be that mentor and guide to help them get the results that they're after. And it helps me sleep pretty much most nights really well, knowing that I'm helping people, you know, be less confused and things like that. So I'm really curious sort of where you're coming from in your your sort of framework of empathy to help people. To help people exit survival mode and re-enter community. Beautiful, beautiful. Confidence really does come from community. We're all stronger together. Uh, it's, it's a key need. And to build your, your community, having confidence and having your brain and body, your body, mind, spirit, energy operating in a certain way is going to help you build to exit, community as well. To exit survival mode. I mean, I, I speak just from my own arc of just being marginalized, gaslit, uh, isolated, uh, and so on, and just being a constant survival mode. And that the, the opposite of trauma is belonging. Mm -hmm. and part of the ability to reconnect to community is to build someone's internal resources and resilience. 
and the 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 ultimate and this this I learned from when I studied with Dr. Kalish for four years. And Dr. Kalish, he's he's been involved with the highest levels of functional medicine of us more than most people are, that have been in functional medicine. And he says in the private discussions over private dinners, the thing that drives the what is the reason and purpose for functional medicine? It's not actually for health. It's actually to support the spiritual evolution of people. Now, you can argue that spiritual evolution is part of health, but it, it's a bigger reason than just health. It's, it's how can we help people evolve spiritually, emotionally by providing them the biochemical and physical uh, resilience and, and optimization so that they can be as resourced as possible as they continue to grow. And, and that's, that's another way of saying to exit survival mode and re-enter community. Mm -hmm. Amen. There's a part two to that on optimizing the space between all those biochemical interactions as well, mm -hmm. which is super powerful. I'm so grateful for you, Dr. Sam Shea, for being on the show. Thanks, everybody, for joining us right here on the School of Radiance podcast. Be sure to share this episode, subscribe, and check out ways that Dr. Sam Shea can support you. And we'll see you all again very soon right here on the School of Radiance podcast.